Okay. So good morning, everybody. We're back to neurominology. Uh, this is lecture eight. What we're going to do here is talk more about the regulation of inflammation in CNS. Lecture seven, we did adaptive immune responses. If you guys haven't seen that lecture, it's on YouTube. If you're having trouble with those links, I can email them to you. I should have all seven lectures now on YouTube. I know some people have watched them. I've seen you know, at least a few people have looked at them, so that's good. You guys are finding them. And this one will be there too today as well. Um, I just wanted to start with a little bit of a review. Um, uh, let's go through the objectives first. So, so we want to understand this connection between you know, microglia activation and how they're regulated by neurons, astrocytes, and other cells. And this is going to kind of get into that kind of positive negative uh, feedback loops. And we'll talk about the, the consequence of, of imbalanced inflammatory responses. And then we want to close, and I want to talk about this idea of these different profiles of microglia. And I'll talk more about these M1, M2 uh, responses. And I, and I think it's a good basis, and I know it's a little bit outdated, but I want to go through them because as we're starting to see more of those, those single cell uh, sequencing data, and I think people are looking at transcriptome profiles of microglia and other cells, that it at least gives you a sort of a a place to com start comparing, you know, trying to figure out whether a cell is inflammatory or has a repair profile or if it, it's doing something else. So it gives us a basis for comparison. And that's why I think it's worthy to discuss the kind of history of that. So this is a slide that you guys have, have already seen. I'll cut my face out so you could see it. But this is um, just showing you the different populations of cells. And you guys should probably know this by now where the microglia are coming from and versus the CNS macrophages, right? So just, I wanted to put you guys in the mood here and show you a couple of these slides. You know, we wanna talk mostly about microglia, which are, you know, myeloid progenitor cells. I've told you that they, um, you know, they're here in the brain parenchyma. Everybody should know what parenchyma is by now. And showing you that these paravascular monocytes come from the bone marrow and take up space in the paravascular space where they get squished like a little tube. Um, and you see them here, just to remember again that there will be questions on the exam that, that ask you to differentiate between microglia and sinus macrophages. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, review that. Remember that these macrophages are in the meninges, choroid plexus and circumventricular organs. Um, just showing you again, sort of the dynamics of the paravascular space. It's not quite this large. It's just showing you this, this, you know, where these macrophages are in relation to where the microglia are. I'm going through these slides very fast because we've already talked about them and I, and I do like to reinforce them, um, but we don't have to go through them in great detail. This is that Hickey paper that we talked about uh, on Tuesday, where we're seeing, you know, they were able to show you that these CNS macrophages here in the paravascular space were the ones that could present antigen very effectively. Um, we talked about this already, I think, in a prior prior lecture. Don't exactly remember which one, but this is the idea, kind of classic paper now from Genoa, showing that the microglia come from the embryonic yolk sac. Actually, all long-lived tissue macrophages come from the embryonic yolk sac. Uh, we see that they come to the brain in rodents, or at least in mice, in embryonic um, uh, day, day uh, nine and a half, essentially. You see these little blue dots. And um, uh, we don't, this is just not really relevant, but this idea that, um, you know, microglia is, are turned over this is just showing you that likely microglia are not being turned over from the bone marrow. So microglia, if there's turnover, which appears to be rather slow, you know, it's likely coming from a, a local source. And we've already talked about these experiments. This is just showing you low turnover and that microglia aren't coming from the bone marrow. Um, it, this is, uh, you know, something that's, that we take for granted now in that we know microglia are myeloid and they come from a source within the brain. But let me tell you that when I was younger, uh, this was sort of a huge question and uh, one that I think we now know pretty well. Um, so this is that col colony stimulating factor receptor antagonist that blocks microglia survival. 
this is something that that's been used as a cool tool for years now um, showing that you can basically use this antagonist through the diet and then all your microglia and and many of your long-lived tissue macrophages also uh, uh, die and that they go away this is some data i think that we've we've shown before that you put these mice on the inhibitor and it takes about three three days and you start to see these iba1 positive microglia um, disappearing and by day 21 or 14 days you see there's there's a you know this elimination of them um, so this is the other part of it too that that sort of hints at it's it the ability to regenerate microglia um, this is when you stop giving the drug so you give plexicon uh, this is the 3397 which is the older version those of you who use the um, newer version of it, uh, but it, it does, when you stop giving it, the microglia come back. And the qu thing here is that they're not coming back from the bone marrow, they're coming back from, you know, whatever percentage of, of microglia that persist. Okay, so this is stuff that I want to get into today that, that we haven't focused on, on as much. And, and this is that idea of, of balance. And um, the balance here is that the brain wants to maintain an anti-inflammatory balance. And so you see a lot of things expressed like growth factors that tend to, to reduce inflammation. So transforming growth factor here would be, would be one of those. Um, we know that, that there are contributions of anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-4 and IL-10. These may be coming from meningeal T cells. Uh, we also know that the you know, microglia and the monocyte Myeloid cells will make IL-1 receptor antagonist. So all these things sort of are, are anti-inflammatory. S1 beta astrocyte is supposed to be anti-inflammatory. Uh, Insulin-like growth factor is another growth factor. Fraptokine comes from neurons and CD200 comes from neurons. And these things maintain this, this balance. What offsets this balance are the pro-inflammatory mediators. A lot of what we've talked about, you know, or hinted at before, the things like IL-1, TNF-alpha, IL-6, interferon gamma. You guys remember from last lecture that interferon gamma was a strong promoter of what sort of uh, response? Do you guys remember? Viral. What's that? Uh, viral. Yeah, what, what cell type is interferon gamma? Interferon gamma is produced by a T cell, right? Do you know what kind, TH1 or TH2? One. TH1, and what cell does it stimulate? Macrophage. Right, okay, so that's good. Little retention from, from on Tuesday. So interferon gamma is a big pro-inflammatory cytokine. And all, all those things that were said were true. It comes from a TH1 T cell, it drives macrophages, and it tends to be antiviral response. Other things that we see is sort of changing the balance would be reactive oxygen species. That's the ROS here, these are oxidative uh, compounds that are used to, to kill uh, pathogens. And then prostaglandins, these are the uh, sort of the secondary signals you see after cytokine signals. So why does this balance exist? And I want you to sort of think about this. So the balance exists because the, we want to maintain this anti-inflammatory environment to maintain homeostasis. Remember that neurons uh, like to function at a certain pH and osmolarity and cellularity and that things that disrupt that will affect just the basic premise of the brain, right? Body to brain transmission, um, uh, body to brain, brain to body, right? So those, those get disrupted if you have a change in this balance. There's also can be the, the risk of damage and, and pathogenesis, right? So there's that, you know, downfall of this. So to generate inflammation, you know, it's, it's energy expensive. And that's why you see a lot of these cytokines sort of change the energy balance. And there's actually a lot of interesting data looking at inflammation and metabolism. And that might not be another sort of interesting uh, neuroimmunology paper for those of you guys still thinking about what topic you're gonna do is this meta metabolic balance. And sort of the, the drawback too is as you're, as you're doing these inflammatory responses, they're potentially damaging to CNS tissue. So, if we do generate these inflammatory responses, we want them to be rapid uh, and maintain uh, for the appropriate amount of time. 
And so we have a lot of mechanisms in place to tightly regulate this, as you can imagine, right? It just makes sense that if you, if you wanna maintain the integrity of the CNS, you have to have tight control. So we know that these microglia are myeloid derived. They have a lot of tissue macrophage-like activities. We know they change quite dramatically with activation. We can see the change of shape. Do you guys remember why we talked about maybe they shrink up like that? Migration. Yeah, migration, right, is, is one idea. And so they also, you know, in this state can be producing things like cytokines, right? And these cytokines can influence neurons and other microglia and other cell types. So what seems to kind of keep this in check are a lot of different things. So hormones like glucocorticoids seem to keep this process in check or can, can regulate or modulate this response. Neuropeptides like vas vasopressin and alpha melanotrophin uh, also keep this in check. Growth factors like insulin-like growth factor and BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor seem to be keep this sort of anti-inflammatory uh, profile. Um, the other thing that we see is that there's a balance between inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. We'll talk a little bit more about this one. This is IL-1 receptor antagonist. It's something that showed up on the NF-kappa B pathway, I asked you to know, is that when a cell makes IL-1, it also makes the receptor antagonist. It's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So as you're driving inflammation, you're also kind of hedging your bets to, to shut off inflammation. The anti-inflammatory cytokines as well help do this. TGF-beta is one of them, IL-10, IL-4, and IL-13. And if you look closely at these anti-inflammatory cytokines, they tend to be the ones that also drive a TH2 response, right? So if you think about the immunology, general connection that, that, you know, things that drive TH1 are inflammatory, things that drive TH2 are sort of more anti-inflammatory factors. And then we have a number of neuronal derived factors that, that also influence this. So fractokine is a major one. Fractokine is a, falls into the chemokine family. It's the CX3CL1 is the ligand. This is uh, produced by neurons. It's expressed on the surface and also can be secreted. And Michael, we have a very high number of receptors for this. If you were to do you know, protein expression in the brain or proteinomics in the brain, fractalkine receptor and fractalkine ligand are very highly expressed. Uh, neurons also have CD22 and CD200 in this heat shock protein 60. So these are a lot of different factors, but again, it's because you really wanna maintain this anti-inflammatory environment. So you have a lot of checks and balances to do that. And it comes from all different cell types. You can imagine that other microglia involved, astrocytes, neurons, oligodendrocytes all wanna maintain that anti-inflammatory environment. Okay, so this is a, a little bit more detail, kind of trying to put the things in context and this is something that I think I, I highlighted a little bit um, a few lectures ago, but really didn't talk a lot about. So let's talk about this idea a little bit. Let's start with the, with the microglia. There's two factors that are thought to be sort of self-regulatory. So if microglia can make IL-10, interleukin-10, and IL-1 receptor antagonist. And these things are sort of autocrine and help shut off this signal. Okay. We also know that, you know, what microglia make a lot of times, the end target are neurons, right? So if you want an inflammatory response to infection, to change behavior and change energy balance, ultimately, what cell type do you need to act on? And the answer is neurons, right? So a lot of things that microglia make in terms of cytokines and reactive mediators like prostaglandins, reactive oxygen species and nitric oxide can work directly on neurons. The astrocytes as well are going to be producing things that help limit microglia. These are gonna be mostly in that glial growth factor um, uh, kind of category like S100 beta. Astrocytes have been you know, thought to, to produce a number of cytokines including anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, one for sure that they make is TGF beta that help again, shut off microglia. Now, neurons, um, like we talked about, we use things like fractokine to keep microglia in check. We'll talk more about that. 
Um, and there's also a number of activating factors. So you can imagine too, if you have a viral infection or you have sinus damage, you need to weigh a warning signal to other cells that something's happening. And so microglia are very sensitive what, to what changes happen in neuronal homeostasis. So if they start seeing a lot of neurotransmitters or uh, neural proteins like alpha synuclein or uh, neuropeptides like substance P, these can be strong activators factors for microglia and astrocytes. And in general, I think the astrocytes are, are important as well because of the amount of sort of the growth factors they make. So they make growth factors that microglia respond to, but also make what are called neurotropins, which is a fancy word for a neural growth factor that help keep um, neurons safe. So um, things like brain-derived neurotropic factor. So a little bit more of, of kind of the signaling that happens here. And I think it's, it's this crosstalk between them that I want you to think about this to more three dimensions. It's not just one cell in a vacuum producing cytokines, it's, it's this interplay between all of them, ultimately to, to influence some of those behavior pathways that, that we've talked about. So I think this comes right out of one of the uh, review articles that I put in there. And some of them are a little bit older, but I think they, they you know, these regulatory pathways really haven't changed. There's been some new ones. And so I did add a 2017 paper in there as well. Uh, but here's a general premise of things that activate microglia and things that uh, you know, shut microglia off. So on the activation side, you can see all the inflammatory signals like IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, reactive oxygen species, nitric oxide, the PGs as prostaglandins. They'll also sense things from, from neurons. So high glutamate, this would be you know, something that they would pay attention to. And this ATP, UTP, ADP, these are, you know, cell energy responses, right? So the cell really isn't supposed to be releasing a lot of ATP, uh, usually represents some, some sort of damage or, or um, alarm system. So microglia have a lot of receptors, they're called pernergic receptors to these um, a, uh, ATP, UDP things. And then there's also the, anything that activates the PAMPs or DAMPs. So if you remember the pattern associated molecular pattern receptors are toll-like receptors. And we know that microglia have the most of those. So the highest diversity of those compared to all other cell types. Other things, you know, called DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns. So again, look, pick, picking up on cues that something's happening to an oligo or a neuron will be activate microglia. We talked about this a little bit, alpha synuclein or substance P, you know, neuronal unique proteins or neuropeptides will activate it. There's also factors in, in serum like fibrinogen that can activate microglia very strongly. Anyone know where you think, you know, where the microglia in the brain would be interacting more directly with, with blood? What area of the brain? I'm just making sure people are still awake here. Near the choroid. Yeah, so in the circumventricular organs, right? They're gonna have more of that direct blood sampling. Exactly. Okay, so ones that seem to shut off microglia activation uh, would be neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. Um, so uh, one, one area that that's may interest you is the endocannabinoid. Uh, so, you know, I may or may not have just bought some cannabis stocks today, uh, right before lecture started, uh, because of their anti-inflammatory effects on microglia. Um, the, the other ones would be GABA, which is, a, you know, it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, dopamine, um, norepinephrine also seems to attenuate microglia responses. The other major ones you probably would guess, anti-inflammatory cytokines, TGF-beta, IL-10, IL-4, IL-13, IL-1 receptor antagonists, glucocorticoids, and then these neuronal mediated. Uh, fratokine, CD200, CD22, heat shock protein 60, and then growth factor. So a wide array of things. And we'll go through some of these in a little more detail, but definitely expect that on the test, I'm gonna ask you to know, know the difference between an activating factor and an inhibitory factor, right? So that's why I made this slide yellow. It's a pretty good review to see all of them together. Okay, so I wanna go through a couple examples. Um, this is uh, uh, how microglia get activated by serum fibrinogen. 
Um, the, the, the fibrinogen receptor is actually a uh, complex of CD18, which CD, if you remember, it stands for clusters of differentiation. It's an immune cell uh, uh, denotation. This also has, it, it complexes with CD11B, which many of you may have used before as a marker in flow cytometry. So these things uh, complex with uh, fibrinogen and you get more of this enhanced phagocytosis. So this is a strong stimulator for microglia to become more phagocytic. Okay. So neuronal regulation of CNS inflammation. We know that neuron structure and function is extremely sensitive to damage by microglia overactivation. This could be that more of that indirect cytokine signaling, nitric oxide, reactive oxygen species. And so they have a lot at stake at regulating inflammation, meaning they wanna keep that anti-inflammatory balance. They seem to have constant communication with, with microglia, whether it's you know, sort of a, a, a cell protein on the surface that comes in contact with microglia or by secreting things that keep microglia in check. And so what's sort of interesting is, is in terms of this neuronal activation is that, uh, you know, in order, when you see a transcriptome analysis of, a, of an active microglia, what oftentimes you see is that all those homeostatic genes, the ones that you normally find on a surveying microglia, get, uh, see a reduced expression. And so, the idea would be that in order to respond to activating signals, it has to kind of shed those inhibitory receptors. And you see that. And so one of the things that kind of gets, uh, I hate the word, but maybe we can use it down-regulated. So things that get down-regulated or decreased would be the fratocon receptor. Um, and so it helps you escape that uh, regulation by the neurons. Okay. So how does it respond to some of these things? So what, do, what receptors do microglia have that you know, uh, respond to neuronal things? Um, and that was a little bit unclear, but I, I did tell you that, that the pernergic receptors are things that will respond to uh, ATP. Um, and they also have receptors for uh, neurotransmitters. They have receptors for norepinephrine, which are the beta adrenergic receptors, dopamine receptors, and then glutamate receptors. From the context of, of yeah, sorry, in the context of responding to inflammatory signals, they have cytokines receptors. We know they have a lot of them. And they also have those toll-like receptors. Again, a lot of toll-like receptors. And then there's this idea of these damage associated receptors too. We just had this discussion about fibrinogen. Um, so this is just showing you a little more that the idea is with neuronal activation of microglia, it's mostly gonna be a change in, in neuronal homeostasis. So uh, if we have excess glutamate, this is going, the microglia gonna respond with the glutamate receptor. If they have excess ATP, the pernergic receptors, there's two here, the P2Y6 or P2Y12, P2Y7. These are three pernergic receptors that can activate microglia. So glutamate is, is really the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter released by neurons. And excessive release causes something called that excitotoxicity. Probably most of you have heard of that. Excess glutamate can kill neurons. So it's very important that we can respond to that. We talked about before that astrocytes can pick up glutamate through glutamate transporters and also uh, convert it to glutamine, sort of the non-reactive form. So there is a, a series of glutamate uh, receptors on the surface of, 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 of microglia that, that can lead to uh, activation. Uh, and you see this activation in a couple of different disease states. Um, what it can do is when you see excess glutamate, one of the pathways that, that it activates in microglia is TNF-alpha. Um, and so that's kind of how the, the microglia become activated with high levels of glutamate. So another sort of idea here is the sensing of uh, ATP, UDP, and others. And again, these are through the pernergic receptors. Um, so UDP is gonna be released from injured neurons. It's gonna activate the P2Y6 receptor on microglia. 
Um, P2Y12 is going to be responsive to ATP. And it also, you know, you can sense, it can sense low ATP and high ATP. So it can differentiate. Both are, both are, represent changes in homeostasis, right? So high ATP seems to um, activate microglia more sort of in that pro-inflammatory response. And then uh, low ATP seems to help change the process movement. So microglia processes move their, extend their, their processes. Okay. So how to respond to some of these off signals from neurons. Um, so things that help shut microglia off, these neurotransmitters and neuropeptides, uh, they have the alpha seven nicotinic receptor. Um, anyone know what receptor, what neurotransmitter activates that one? Acetylcholine. That's right. Beta adrenergic, what, which, which neurotransmitter activates beta adrenergic receptor? Norepinephrine. Right. Okay. So it's going to respond to some of these things. These generally have a sort of modulating effect on microglia. Uh, one of the big ones here we've, we've talked about before in terms of uh, anti-inflammatory feedback is the glucocorticoid receptor. All right. So this is a nuclear receptor. If you guys remember, it was one of those receptors that that's the, the res response on that's very close to the NF-kappa B site and can actually knock NF-kappa B off the promoter. So microglia can respond directly to that. Another big one is the TGF beta, TGF beta receptor on, on microglia. TGF beta can be made by a wide variety of cells, including astrocytes. Um, and then there are neuronal mediated factors. This, this is fratzokine. It's easier to say than saying CX3, CL1. Um, the receptor is CX3, CR1. So R is for receptor, L is for ligand. Um, this is called CD200. This is another uh, receptor on microglia that's been, uh, you know, shown to be important for anti-inflammatory regulation of microglia. The complement part here on neurons or the, the, the uh, uh, ligand is CD200. There's also CD22, which binds to CD45, and then heat shock protein 60 that binds to, to TREB2. Microglia self-regulation, this is something um, I wanted to go into a little bit more. And I think we've seen this just a little bit, but I wanted to reinforce this and definitely uh, I will ask something about IL-1 receptor antagonist. So as you're making IL-1, if microglia are making IL-1, they're also making the receptor antagonist. And just as the kind of description tells you, it, it, it blocks the receptor. So it binds the receptor and it doesn't cause, uh, it doesn't initiate that intracellular signaling. So it basically blocks the intercellular signaling of IL-1 receptor. It doesn't really quite look like this, but for our class, um, this is probably the best way to show it. And so it, it's a way of self-regulating that IL-1 response. Um, the other one that we see is IL-10. Uh, it's another one that as you're making inflammatory cytokines through NF-kappa B, you're making IL-10. It also functions to feed back on the cell and help shut off that signal. Uh, microglia will have a pretty high level of IL-10 receptor um, as well as uh, IL-4 receptor, which is another um, TH2-like cytokine. Um, there's a lot of examples if you start messing with these receptors, uh, receptor antagonist or uh, IL-4, IL-10 receptor that you have uh, excessive inflammation. And so. Uh, probably likely hundreds of papers uh, you can find on this, on these ideas. And the simplest way to do this, right, is to make, you know, receptor knockouts or self-specific knockouts and see that when you, you challenge the system, either with disease or injury, that the microglia responses are more inflammatory. So really kind of easy cause and effect type stuff. Um, this is some of the getting in a little bit into the different types of pathways um, that, that, I, that I wanted to talk about towards the end. And this is the idea of different profiles of microglia from the, depending on the activation state. Um, and this kind of gets into the same idea, you know, how we talked about Th1 and Th2 responses. Well, it turns out that they're, you know, a classification for, for 
macrophages is, is M1, M2. And so they've tried to use this for microglia, uh, especially within the last decade, they've used this, this idea. And some people absolutely hated it. Some people liked it and I'm sort of in the middle. I think it can be important, important to kind of help you understand the different profiles. And I think they are useful, although they may not be exactly correct, but, but here's kind of what the idea is, is that um, the M1 microglia is this more inflammatory one. It's gonna be producing things like IL-1 beta. You're gonna see increase on things on here like FC receptors, MHC class two, um, some of those co-receptors, if you remember, CD86 is one of the cofactors needed for engine presentation. So you have this more you know, inflammatory macrophage-like profile, the microglia. And then if you, if you take this profile, right, and then you're doing this in the context of, now there's, there's high anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-4, IL-13, more of those TH2 cytokines, you get a M2A repair alternative activation. So now you're shifting the balance of microglia more towards repair. And you certainly see this in vivo, right? So you see microglia that become these scavenging cells that clear areas of debris, take up dead cells and viral infections. So there's definitely this, this component to it. And in culture, you can drive this with uh, several anti-inflammatory cytokines. Then we see this idea of classic deactivation. And that's kind of what we we're getting into with the IL-10 and IL-4 or at least the IL-10 or IL-1 receptor antagonist, where you start to see that these things um, drive a classic deactivation where we see things go up on the microglia like IL-4 receptor, IL-10, and then these SOCs, which are these uh, suppressor of cytokine signaling. So this is sort of the idea here of, of changing the profile once it's been activated. Um, this is, I think, just showing you some data here from an IL-10 uh, deficient mouse. Uh, if you give LPS, which probably you guys remember is this very potent innate immune stimulator. So you're going to stimulate an innate immune response to LPS. Um, and uh, they find here is that with, with the knockout, you see same levels of cortisol, maybe a little bit higher here at a different time point. But the really uh, thing you see here is the reduction of growth factors in IL-10 deficient mice and uh, an increase in, in impaired spatial memory and learning. So the idea here is that when you don't have IL-10, you change the balance and you affect a number of anti-inflammatory pathways. And ultimately the mice have a worse behavior response. Um, so one thing to talk about here is the suppressor of cytokine signaling. There are SOX families of proteins. I don't know if you guys have ever done different arrays on microglia, but you'll definitely see some of these. They're driven mostly by these anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, IL-4, IL-13. Remember that for microglia, a lot of these are thought to be sort of autocrine that the microglia make these cytokines and also respond to them. Um, but other things can make these cytokines like T cells, for example, and uh, neutrophils and astrocytes. And so you see that it really doesn't matter who makes them, but it does reduce the activation state of microglia through these SOX proteins, which basically um, are, SOCs are generated by the JAK-STAT pathway, so this inflammatory pathway and help mediate inflammation. Okay, so again, a little bit more on these uh, neurotransmitters. So um, norepinephrine, dopamine, uh, acetylcholine are all pretty anti-inflammatory. Again, the reason that the micro can respond to them is because they have receptors for them. Um, it seems to also, uh, you know, change uh, activation state. If you were to affect these neurotransmitter systems, we can see an increase in inflammation. So, um, you know, one of the ideas here is that loss of the neuroendrenic neurons in, in Alzheimer's disease may be caused by increased microglia activation. Um, and then we see a lot of stuff in culture that, you know, you can modulate microglia responses uh, using acetylcholine or nicotine tend to be anti-inflammatory. 
lowering responses to LPS and lowering um, uh, other factors. And so just one caveat here, if you look really closely at a lot of this neurotransmitter work for microglia, it tends to be on in vitro research. And people from my lab probably tell you that, you know, you can basically get anything to work in vitro. Um, another one uh, that we see inhibiting microglia response is GABA. GABA is, tends to be a, a, just your primary in, uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, many of you know probably that GABA agonists are used as sort of anti-anxiety drugs. Um, we know there's GABA receptors on microglia and that agonists, GABA agonists tend to lower inflammation. Again, most of this tends to be in uh, culture, while there have been some data to, to say that that loss of GABAergic neurons can, can increase microglia activation. And some people see this sort of within age. Okay, cannabinoids are, are really interesting uh, because microglia also have these endocannabinoid receptors. And endocannabinoids tend to be very anti-inflammatory. Um, and so we see that endocannabinoid treatment of microglia uh, can attenuate their activation. And in several models, I and mean, there's probably a lot of them now that use endocannabinoids and you can reduce inflammation. One here uh, from a while ago was in a thyroid virus model. This is a, a model where you get the spontaneous autoimmune disease. And this, this was endocannabinoids helped uh, reduce that. Endocannabinoids actually, we, we published a paper are really effective in, in reducing stress responses and stress associated inflammation. Um, so again, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of immune cells have receptors that can respond directly to those endocannabinoids. So I think this is another important slide looking a little closely. Again, these are some of the same ideas, just looking a little more visually at it. These neuronal off signals, a lot of these are actually uh, membrane bound. So they actually require contact with the microglia. So CD200 receptor on on a microglia, you know, it binds closely with the CD200 on, on neurons, CD22 binds CD45 on microglia and heat shock protein 60 binds TREM2. And then fratokine receptor can either be membrane bound or you can have actual release of fratokine and it gets processed by, pro, uh, by a enzyme, enzyme, enzyme fa family called ADAMS. Um, so, you know, why is this normal mediated? I think it's because, um, you know, that the, the, the regulation is specialized to the environment. And if they're going to be responding to things within the CNS, it seems like they've become specialized to make sure that they, they respond to these neuronal factors. Okay. This is just another sort of chart to help you kind of come in contact with, with what's happening. Um, so if we look at CD, let's look at the bottom here to start, C200 ligand and C200 receptor. These are gonna signal through tyrosine kinases. That means it's a, the, the kinase adds a phosphorylation group to an ATP to a, to a tyrosine residue. The effect here is essentially contact inhibition and tends to be anti-inflammatory. So again, neurons keeping microglia in check. TREM2, uh, they're not exactly sure what the ligand is. It's been proposed to be heat shock protein 60. Uh, it uses a intracellular signaling component called DAP12. And so if you guys look closely, there's a lot of work on microglia looking at TREM2 knockouts or DAP12 knockouts. And the idea is that you see modulation directed phagocytosis and tends to be anti-inflammatory. And then protocon ligand and receptors G protein linked. This seems to have a strong inhibitory effect and the outcome is, is really the reduction of, of, of number inflammatory pathways. The TREM2 one is, is really interesting. So any of you guys who um, are interested in Alzheimer's disease, there's been a series of papers looking at this TREM2 signaling TREM2 stands for triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells. And there's an interesting human mutation that leads to NASO-Hakula, 
uh, disease. So it's a human mutation in TREM2 and it causes neurodegenerative disease. And you have a major problem with two subtypes of myeloid cells or myeloid derived cells. It's the microglia and osteoclasts. If you guys know what osteoclasts are, they're involved in bone remodeling. So what happens is in these individuals, you have bone cysts and then early onset delirium. And in the brains of these people, you see significant evidence of inflammation. And uh, you can get a similar phenotype by knocking out this DAP12. And so what's interesting about this pathway is, is that, you know, TREM2 mutations are also high, highly found uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So here's a pathway that is neuronally directed that if you have problems with it, you may lose that regulation by the neurons. You have microreactivation, you have increased inflammation, and you have uh, cognitive decline, delirium. And in Alzheimer's, of course, you have uh, neurogeneration. So a lot of interest in TREM2 signaling in, in microglia. Um, TREM2 knockout mice. So um, this is you know, some, some famous studies on this. Uh, they see this degenerative phenotype and impaired microglia activation sorry, increased microglia activation. One of the really classic ones, this neuronal off signal is dysfratokine. I know I've mentioned it seven times already today and also seven, seven, something that reminds us or something that is relevant to seven is that the receptor is a transmembrane G protein linked receptor. That's called a serpentine receptor because it passes through the membrane. You guessed it seven times. And, uh, it can respond to the, to the membrane bound. So there's fratokine receptor that's, that's on the surface of, of neurons. So they come in close contact, but it also can be, um, the little scissors here show you that it can be cleaved and released and that the, the microglia can, can respond to it both in the sort of resting stage and sort of in the, the active stage. So it's actually a uh, chemokine family. It's in the CX, 3C design. Um, so that's a cysteine and then X can be any, any amino acid and then it's gonna be uh, a repeat of three Xs and then another cysteine. Um, so it, it can bind either the membrane bound or soluble. It's mostly cleaved by ADAM10, which is a protease. Uh, and you see this high level of fratokine ligand and receptor normally. I'm telling you, if you do PCR or you look at transcriptome analysis of microglia or neurons, you find that both are highly expressed normally. So one of the cool things is that to circumvent this regulation, you can see that, that, that microglia here, you're, you're surveying microglia responding to this tonic single, signal from the neurons through the fatokine receptor and then when they become highly activated as they're changing their structure, one thing that they do is internalize the receptor. So now you have a system that you're less responsive to that regulation. So now other thing you know, becomes highly more activated and you're producing cytokines. So it appears that they, they down-regulate this. And, and someone in my lab in 2010 showed this, and I think you can see it pretty clearly now in, in a lot of the newer studies of transcriptome analysis of microglia. Um, there's also these classic papers by a, a famous neurologist, uh, Richard Branselhoff, used to be at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, not sure where he's at now, but he's, he's a brilliant uh, uh, neuroscientist. And they, they were doing some of the initial studies using these fratokine receptor knockout mice. Um, some of you may, have, may still use these mice and don't even know it. These fratokine mice the, were homozygote for, re, for the receptor loss but the um, heterozygote ones actually have a GFP in there. And so it makes the microglia visible. So some of you who have used these, you know, looked at GFP positive fratokine microglia actually use the, the HET version of these mice. Um, anyway, the knockouts, when you don't have the fratokine receptor on microglia, you see much more inflammation with a native immune challenge. Here they're using lipopolysaccharide and they found evidence of neuronal loss. This is showing you sort of the normal microglia. I believe this is a, I think it's an IP LPS injection. And then here you see more kind of reactive looking microglia and they see these um, 
the uh, new N plus an X and five, which is supposed to show you more apoptotic neurons. So they, they argued here that you see this apoptotic death of neurons when you can't regulate microglia. Um, this is some data that Angela showed from my lab that basically if you knock out fratacon receptor, that the mice, this is the social behavior that I think we talked about before, uh, that the mice get sick with LPS injection and the ones that can't regulate the microglia through fratokine stay sick longer. And I think you see that there are um, more inf inflammatory cytokines. So this is, uh, um, you know, IL-1 expression in the, in the knockouts compared to the HET control. So more inflammatory IL-1, um, no difference here in, in toll 2. Um, and then that, this is at the four hour time point when the sickness is sort of at the greatest. And then as the mice are recovering, uh, the wild type or HET mice get better and we still see a higher expression of, of two inflammatory mediators uh, 24 hours later. The other thing that Angela saw is that in the fratokine receptor knockout mice that the prolonged inflammation had, had more effects on behavior. So one of the things that sort of you don't see normally with uh, an eight immune challenge is this depressive like behavior. Um, this is looking at mobility or motivation in the tail suspension test. Normally a mouse will want to, and want to get out of that situation, just like probably any of us who's hung by you know, our legs or our tail, um, not super happy about it. So you find that the mice are pretty mobile. Um, mice that, that have this change in mood, however, are immobile longer. And that's basically what Angela saw. She didn't see it in any of the controls, but she saw it 72 hours or, and 48 hours after LPS injection, in, only in the knockout. So, there's a consequence to having this prolonged microglia activation, not only potentially on, on brain pathology, potentially the loss of neurons, uh, but uh, you know, behaviorally, you can see things that normally don't show up in, in responses. Um, you can also see these, these more reactive IB1 profiles in the same study in the knockouts compared to the uh, controls. Okay, so just a, just a little bit of review of the fratokine signaling. Um, in the CNS, fratokine restrains microglia and inactivates them. Now, what I wanna bring up here is a little bit of a caveat and I'm calling it duality. So fratokine is also a chemokine, right? And so it's not restrained just to the CNS, fratokine is in the receptor show up you know, everywhere in the body, and particularly on myeloid cells, even, even circulating monocytes have the fratokine receptor. Um, so in the periphery fratokine, ligand helps recruit myeloid cells to areas of damage. Um, and there's even some evidence in the brain that, that you know, the reason that microglia are moving their processes is, is along a gradient, right? And part of that gradient might be that neuronally secreted fratokine ligand, right? So they're responding to that Chemo, chemo, or they, they respond to those chemokine factors by moving their processes back and forth. So in the periphery though, you see it much more as a classic uh, chemokine. So there's some interesting things when you start to look at fratokine uh, receptor knockout mice. And it really depends on the context that you're looking at them. So it looks like if you were to, to damage the spinal cord or, or damage the brain where you have the infiltration of peripheral immune cells like monocytes, you can see a lot, a lot of differences uh, there. And so part of it is that fratokine receptor deficient mice might have better outcomes because they don't see the same level of recruitment of neutrophils and monocytes to sites of injury. So one of the, you know, if you're thinking about the best uh, profile you'd want in terms of fratokine receptor expression, this is sort of some interpretation from some results that are out there, including some work by uh, Phil Popovich. He was here at OSU. The, the best phenotype for fratokine receptor expression well, in injury models would be that you have wild type fratokine expression on the microglia, but you have fratokine receptor deficient bone marrow monocytes. So you limit the microglia activation through the fratokine receptor 
in the microglia, and then you, you limit the amount of monocytes coming in by not having that receptor. So something to keep in mind, if you read a lot about fractokine, you'll find, you'll find a lot of evidence of this duality. Um, not sure why it says IL-10 objectives here, um, because we're still in lecture eight, but uh, we do want to talk about this, this idea of, of the M1 and M2. Let's see how much time we have. So at least for another eight minutes, I will talk about this. Um, and again, the M1, M2 idea is more antique, right? And fallen out of favor, but it does give us a basis for some comparisons. And the reason that I think it's important is that if you start to look at the single cell data, and that is looking at single cell expression of, of microglia, you see distinct phenotypes with, you know, during age or during infection or inflammatory response, this paper uh, published in Immunity had nine different distinct categories of microglia. Um, so I think categories of microglia is something that, that neurology really will always wants to do. And so it gives us a, you know, a start for, for uh, comparison. So there's these proposed four basic profiles and it's this M1 versus M2. So the M1 macrophage microglia is this classic activation that produces pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? So this would be the one that you'd see initially with a lipopolysaccharide injection or some sort of CNS infection initially. Um, and then you can get these you know, M2, these alternatively activated microglia macrophages. So M2A is this alternative activation thought to be involved in tissue repair. So in papers that propose that they have an M2 activation of macrophages and microglia, what you see, or what you used to see is arginase, mannose receptor, and this thing called uh, YM1, which I think is chitinase. And these are also thought to be kind of alternative activation. M2B uh, is thought to, to be sort of this inflammatory, inflammatory and homeostatic profile, where it's kind of happening at both times. And this is, this is when you see both IL-1 and IL-10 being produced but microglia at the same time. And then classic deactivation seems like you, something that would happen with time where you see that you know, they were initially activated and then you see this down regulation you know, caused by IL-10, IL-4, and you see an increase in the, the, the SOX signaling, the, the suppressor of cytokine signaling. So here's sort of the idea of what the function is. So an M1 microglia Classic activation activated by LPS, innate immune stimulation, toll activation, interfering gamma. What the microglia are going to make are inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 and TNF-alpha, uh, nitric oxide. Uh, you're going to see a number of things get increased on the surface. These could be MHC proteins, you know, cofactors like CD68. I'm sorry, CD86. You're going to see them involved in trying to destroy microbes. You see them producing reactive oxygen species, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and picking up things either by complemented or antibody-associated phagocytosis. Whereas this M2 alternative repair uh, you see is driven a lot by some of these IL-4, IL-10 pathways, where we're going to see things like arginase uh, increased what this is supposed to be doing is a microglia that's promoting angiogenesis or, or vascular regrowth, uh, producing anti-inflammatory cytokines and producing polyamines, which are uh, other signals for cells important for repair. So one of my pet peeves as uh, a scientist, a grant reviewer and a paper reviewer and, is that I do not like people telling me that they have an active, reactive, whatever microglia by showing me a picture of IBA1 labeling. Uh, and, and people are still guilty of this, unfortunately. And so just, just showing me one figure saying that, you know, you have activated microglia, you know, what does that really even mean? And I think this is, this is the reason that, you know, I like that we are, we're trying to categorize what, what a microglia is doing based on its you know, protein and mRNA profile. Because I'll argue with you that you can't tell anything from the morphology alone. Um, so this is again the the M1, M2, M, M2A, M2C idea. Um, this really just comes from classic uh, monocyte biology, 
Um, and this is probably more relevant for peripheral immunity, although it's been applied to uh, the CNS. Um, and so in the periphery, you get these tissue macrophages that respond to interfering gamma uh, or TNF alpha, and you get this classic activation. So this would essentially be you know, what you're seeing in a Th1 response, right? Uh, the Th2 response is more this antibody driven pathway, you're going to be shutting down macrophages. And so you're going to have these more in that wound healing tissue repair. So that's the M2A. And then with M2C, you're looking at regulatory T cells making IL-10 uh, and also responding to glucocorticoids to get this regulatory anti-inflammatory macrophage. So this is where the idea comes from. It, it has some application within the brain. Okay, so M1 stimuli, interferon TNF alpha are the big ones. Uh, you're going to have uh, this can be a Th1 response, so it can be activated by a, a T cell making interferon gamma to activate a macrophage. This can also be um, through toll receptor binding. This one's just showing you TNF alpha or interferon gamma. These macrophages will in turn make TNF alpha. Um, TNF alpha, this is this TNF alpha will also promote more IL-1 reactive oxygen species. So this is the kind of the pathway there. Um, so what else stimulates an M1 pathway in microglia macrophages or more relevant to the brain? One of them that they see is amyloid beta. So amyloid beta is that kind of misfolded protein in Alzheimer's disease that uh, in vitro and in vivo stimulates more of this classic activation of microglia, um, you know, and then lipopolysaccharide and a lot of bacterial innate challenges will, will strongly promote this M1 profile in vivo and in vitro. Um, are there different M1 profiles? And I think the answer is, is yes. Uh, and I think there's quite a bit of diversity in the M1 profiles, you know, because, in, and we talked about this at the very, very beginning is, you know, neuroinflammation and things are very context dependent. So in EAE, you see these active M1 microglia produce reactive oxygen species, but also help break down the blood brain barrier and strip synapses, right? In the sickness response that we've talked about, we see that microglia you know, produce cytokines and reactive oxygen species, but don't break down the blood-brain barrier and no damage to axons and neurons. Uh, in mild TBI, we've seen these really uh, unique cells called jellyfish microglia um, that look like they, you know, kind of float around and, and, and take up a really uh, unique shape. Uh, I'm thought to be important in, in repair potentially. Beta, am, uh, amyloid beta and fibrogen also activate M1, uh, and this will sort of stimulate chemotaxis and phagocytosis. So again, there's a lot of different M1 profiles, I think that we have yet to uncover, and maybe the single cell will show us some of that. Um, and then this is sort of the M2 stimuli. Again, a lot of this uh, comes from classic monocyte biology. Uh, the M2A is thought to be increased by IL-4 and IL-13. This is going to be coming from Th2 T cells, granocytes, so it's going to be neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and mast cells. Classic deactivation is sort of uh, something that you'll see with you know, sort of the resolution of inflammatory responses to bacterial things or IL-1 stimulation. And then classic deactivation is going to be from TGF beta and IL-10. Um, this is just showing you some of the, the profiling with M2 phenotypes. I do want you guys to, to, to be familiar with some of these things. Uh, classic M1 is this bacterial viral clearance, it's important for host defense. This is sort of classic macrophage biology. The M2A is more alternative host defense uh, involved in, in more of that Th2 type response, reduction of general in inflammation. And then this classic M2C is going to be this um, kind of inhibition. And it turns out that it, if you guys have ever looked for these M1, M2 profiles, it's actually uh, impossible really to see distinct profiles. And what they argue is that it's kind of a, a 
a uh, spectrum. So it's kind of a spectrum of, of what it really looks like and that you see it's that you're actually capturing monocytes or microglia in, in changing its their phases. And so you see a lot of kind of cross reactivity in the different phases. So it's really hard to really distinguish things. You just M1, M2 and M, M2C. So again, the reason that I bring this up and I know I think I'm I think I'm a few minutes over, but I think I only have a couple slides left. Um, the reason I bring this up is because we're seeing so much single cell sequencing now in the context of neuroimmunology that I think you really do see unique profiles and they don't necessarily match up with this idea of M1, M2, you know, 100%, but they are sh showing unique profiles. And so um, this is one that we did uh, from the cortex. This is seven days after a brain injury. And uh, with single cell sequencing, you can see, you can get all the different cell types here from, from the brain. And this is actually from the cortex. So with the resolution of single cell sequencing, you can actually get you know, microglia uh, at a pretty high level. And what we found here, and this is, uh, you know, uh, the best way that I know how to present it is using these pie charts. So in our model here, this is the control we found, I think it was uh, 10 distinct clusters of microglia in the cortex. And you can start to look at what these clusters represent. So remember I told you that there's high levels of fractokine receptor in your surveying microglia. So this cluster three seems to be a, you know, surveying microglia. It's high in something called TMM119, fractokine receptor and TGF beta receptor. So, you know, a cell that is responding to these normal uh, control signals by neurons and other cells. And with TBI, we see, hopefully you can see is that the pie chart changes. And so one thing that I've told you in the, uh, during the course of this lecture is that that homeostatic population shrinks. So that normal regulation of microglia, they seem to change their receptor profiles, those things decrease. And then we see other profiles increase. And the profiles that increase are unique in that they start to see things uh, in cluster six. This is seven days after injury. So it's a little bit kind of in the transition between subacute inflammation and chronic inflammation, but we see, you know, cluster six that really wasn't present there originally increase um, clusters uh, two increase and cluster two ends up being something that looks like a damaged dying or depopulating microglia with a lot of ribosomal proteins. Um, so that, that makes sense. You have CNS damage, you probably have some, some cells dying. And then cluster nine increases too. This cluster nine is something that people have found in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, unclearly what it means, but it has this new profiling of things like Plex7A and APOE and TREM2. Uh, might be more phagocytic microglia. And so what it allows you to do, and, and the reason that I'm bringing this up at the end of the lecture is that I think this sort of allows you to start to characterize microglia uh, in different ways. And so we can take these clusters and say, well, cluster two has a profile that fits this damage depopulating. Cluster seven looks like an actually proliferating cell. And, uh, you know, we saw this really strong TBI effect. So we're calling them TRAMs uh, for TBI associated microglia. We saw two really strong clusters, cluster eight and cluster six. And then um, these cluster nine have been previously identified as these disease associated microglia. So I think it gives us, again, a new exciting way to uh, look at the, the profile through these transcriptome analyses. Um, and, you know, if you look for those M1 markers, you find them, you know, more in this profile. If you look for some of those M2 markers, you actually see it more in, in some, of, some of these guys. So those profiles still are relevant and you can still look at them, um, but I kind of wanted to give you the history of it uh, uh, to just to show you that stuff. So I think that is uh, the end of my lecture today. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. 
Um, yeah, I have a question. So do you think that there's anything cell intrinsic um, determining the activation state that the microglia are going to acquire? Or is it all solely based on like the surrounding microenvironment, whether they're going to, you know, acquire more of an M1 versus an M2? Like, obviously, it's state dependent on the microenvironment. But do you think there's any sort of intrinsic bias to kind of prime these cells to acquire one fate over another? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it could be regionally dependent, right? Uh, each, you know, because microglia are a little bit different in different regions, you know, whether they're white matter or gray matter, I mean, whether they're by the CBOs or not. So, yeah, I think that that could be part of it. Also, how old the animal is, with age, we see pretty dramatic changes in those regulatory pathways. But I do think, I mean, I think they, they have to, you know, if you saw all those signals we talked about today, I mean, we had the whole thing of things that turn them on and off. I mean, at, at a signal transduction level, it's interpreting all those signals that happening at once, you know? And I think it's what's, what's fascinating to me is that to overcome some of those inhibitory signals, you actually see the receptors get, sh get, get internalized or, or shredded so that it makes sense and how they, how they, uh, kind of de decrease sensitivity to those neuronal signals so that they can respond to the kind of activating signals. And I think that's exactly what you see in those transcriptome analysis. With. So something that I thought about in 2010 to be confirmed to me, at least in my own mind in 2021 is, 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 is very rewarding. Yeah, because I'm just thinking in context of like, obviously when you're looking at the cortex, like it's you know really big and obviously there's a lot of region dependent changes, but if you were to do single cell RNA-seq on like a damaged retina, which is like a pretty homogeneous piece of tissue, there are subclusters of microglia um, kind of showing different states. And so I'm wondering, I'm like, is it, I would guess it's probably not something about the microglia. It's just gotta be like this stochastic uh, microenvironment, you know, which receptors are getting most activated on this random microglia versus, you know, the one couple, you know. And I think you're also it. running into the, I'm gonna stop recording this and I'll, and I'll just so we don't, I'm happy to keep answering questions. I'll just stop recording.